Hello and welcome to Cougarosities, a WSU Advancement podcast series featuring conversations with WSU experts as they answer some of the world's most pressing questions. As a tier one research institution, Washington State University is committed to untangling complex research problems to enrich the quality of life for everyone. Each episode will chat with a different expert or panel of experts on a variety of timely topics. I'm Haley Rupp, and this is my co-host, Anna Burton. Today's topic is women's invisible labor. The COVID-19 pandemic led to the release of a new phrase, essential worker. Ranging from grocery store clerks to healthcare professionals, this workforce continued to report in the midst of a global outbreak. Not only do women make up the majority of essential workers, they also take on the majority of caregiving roles, child care, teaching from home, elder care, and much more. Today we're joined by Dr. Julie Kamek and Dr. Anna Zamora Kapoor as they discuss what COVID-19 is teaching us about women work in the future. Dr. Kamek, we'll start with you for introductions and to learn a little bit more about your research. Hello, my name is Julie Kamek and I'm a professor of sociology in the College of Arts and Sciences. And the research that I do primarily centers around gender inequality at work. I've studied things like sexual harassment at work, the glass ceiling. I'm very interested in understanding how families interact with workplaces, including the extent to which family members experience family responsibilities discrimination. And some of my new work explores women's participation in engineering. My name is Anna Zamora Kapoor. I'm a scientist, I'm a mother of a two and a half year old, and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Sociology, as well as the Department of Medical Education and Clinical Sciences at WSU. And I'm also the community liaison for the Health Equity Research Center. My research really sits at the intersection of sociology and medicine, and some of my work pertinent to women's issues has to do with maternal child health around breastfeeding and the role of health services in promoting breastfeeding, especially in minority women. How is COVID-19 impacting genders differently? Yes, so um, the the coronavirus has really changed the bargain or the way that um, families have interacted. You know, prior to this, most professional heterosexual couples would come together and say, we could both go to work because someone's looking after our children, they're going to school. But now that's kind of being flipped on its head. So as you know, probably there are a lot of gendered behaviors in families. Women do certain things and men tend to do certain things. And prior to, again, to the pandemic, both could work outside the home, yet women were primarily doing a lot of this, what we call the second and third shift. The second shift primarily deals with handling housework, handling childcare, and the third shift sort of has to deal with all the sort of cognitive thoughts and organizing to have to go in a household. But now that COVID-19 has brought everyone under one roof all day, I think we're seeing some interesting changes, but also a little bit about gender role, I'll call it regression. That's when women and men sort of slide back into the behaviors prior to women's substantial entry into the paid labor market. So I'm largely talking about professional, well-educated heterosexual couples. What we've known for a long time and what's existed for a long time is that men tend to out-earn women. So oftentimes women work part-time more often than do men, and because women's jobs tend to be devalued. So in in these times that we're thinking about now, couples have to decide whose job takes priority and whose job might suffer. So who goes back to work first, I think is going to be an interesting pattern that we see. Women's jobs might tend to suffer more when it comes time to say who needs to go back to work or who should start spending more time doing work rather than doing more of the childcare. And I think this is something that hasn't really changed is that women are still responsible for these second and third shifts. That at home, women in this time are still likely to be responsible for organizing the day, including establishing boundaries for where the kids can go, during what time, and if they should be talking or not talking because someone's on a Zoom call. And it's funny, a recent survey, let me go back and say too, women are probably being held to or having a greater responsibility for the education of their children at home. And a recent survey found that men think they do more at home than do women in terms of schooling their kids. 40% of men say that they do more homeschooling of their kids than their female partners, but only 3% of women say that men do this. So there is also a very different impression by both men and women about who's doing what. 
So as I said, because women tended to do more of the cognitive, but not only the cleaning and child care, but also the cognitive responsibilities. And this again is like the idea that you keep a running mental list in your head of the kids need to go, what are the kids needs? Um, how, are they, how are they progressing in school, especially when there's not a teacher saying this, maintaining children's friendships and their well-being. I think that when all people are at home all the time, this invisible work, this sort of constant having this running list in your head is becoming more visible. You know, people understand that, okay, we cook and we clean, but now that everyone's home, I think these sort of subtle things that most women are responsible for might be coming to light. And many men may dive more into this sort of operation of the household, but I think they'll only be able to sustain any sort of deep dive they take into these behaviors if employers change when the pandemic ends. But if you think about what happened after World War II or during World War II, women went to factories and employers made it really easy for them to be there because they provided on-site childcare. But as soon as the war ended, men went and took those jobs back. And it's possible that we'll see similar things with COVID-19, that we'll see somewhat of an equalizing of work at home. I say equalizing in the sense that men might be kicking more in because they're there. But as soon as it's over, we might see the same old, same old because employers aren't really changing anything. And it's not that men don't want to do more at home. It's just that they might feel penalized if they try to do so. And I would like to talk a little bit about essential workers. What we've seen here is that there's an overrepresentation of women as well as communities of color and immigrants. Because of this overrepresentation, we see that women are more exposed to COVID-19, right? So in the healthcare environment, for example, 73% of the workers that have been infected with COVID-19 are women. So that sort of brings like a new perspective to this, to this whole phenomenon. Because if you look at the economy, what we've seen is that COVID-19 is, is shrinking the middle class and is generating a dual labor market. There's a labor market where those that have the education and resources to either not work or work from home can do so. And, and those that don't, that don't have that option, they need to go to work and they need to expose themselves to a disease and, and thus expose their families. And what we see is that women are overrepresented in the second wave. So I think really to capitalize on both of your responses, what is this actually telling us to about the gender disparity in the workplace? So we might be seeing a shift or balance, but could it also be dividing us even further? It really depends on what workspace we're, we're thinking about. You know, we're thinking about a workspace of uh, essential workers or non-essential workers. And that sort of, you know, is related to the type of dynamics at home that Julie was mentioning before. I mean, you can imagine that, for example, in households where perhaps, you know, in traditional households, you know, I'm just going to imagine a traditional household with a father and a mother, where the mother needs to go to work because she's an essential worker, perhaps the father is stepping up and, and, and doing more household work and taking care of, you know, children in a way that he was not doing before. However, in households where, work, where both parents are working from home, I would imagine that women are doing most of the work. So when we think about gender equity at work, it really has to do with the household dynamic and how that intertwines with, you know, the distribution of household chores at home. So I just think, I just think that it's very diverse overall. And speaking of what Anna just said, I, I also think, um, as you know, more, as she said, more women are working in essential jobs. And even pre-pandemic, women were working in jobs that required more caregiving, think school teacher or nurse or a social worker, and men, professional men at least, work in, worked in jobs that had sort of less social ties to customers. So if you think like a lawyer or an engineer or a construction worker, and now that a lot of employers are shifting toward caregiving to people, whether it be in the medical profession or in you know, food service, it sort of displays this idea, again, that women and men are very segregated in the workforce. And because a lot of these women are essential workers and the caregivers, there might be higher expectation for them to be dedicated and have responsibility for what's going on than our men. In fact, I would like to add something um, to Julie's point, which is, uh, and this comes from a recent article in the New York Times, which talked about the gradual reopening of the economy and how would potentially how that would potentially impact men and women. And I actually have a quote here that said, for many working mothers, the gradual reopening won't solve their problems, but compound them, forcing them out of the labor force or into part-time jobs while increasing the responsibilities at home. So I think that what's important here to notice is that 
that this phenomenon of COVID-19 is impacting genders in a really drastic way. We're not going back to where we were. And it's kind of revealing all the gaps in the system. It's really gaps in social policy, gaps that, you know, maybe we're not aware of before. So it's really an opportunity for us and for our representatives to come in and develop creative solutions. And if I may, I'll add to that too, this idea of revealing gaps. If you think about it, like school teachers, social workers, nurses, they are not the highest paid employees in our labor market. Yet a lot of them have had to really pivot. Think about school teachers. Within a week, many of them in the United States had to completely shift the way that they taught their classes and interacted with their children. And they're not paid very much to do this. And so I think this COVID time is revealing the extent to which women are doing so much work and um, how little we pay them. And thinking too about now that we're opening, not a lot of jobs exist as they did before and employers might be scaling up into so starting with part-time and then full-time. And we're probably going to see that women are going to be the, the most likely candidates for doing the part-time work in, in a traditional household. Again, going back to this idea that you know, men were, men typically have the highest paying job in a couple or in a family because of the reasons I explained before. I would assume we're going to see a shift too as we balance out the roles that women take on in the field and if there in turn becomes um, the equity and pay and that kind of thing. What are your thoughts on how our future generations will be impacted? Uh, I, I think that um, the future generations will only be impacted or will see a change in sort of what women and men do is if employers create a structure for change. So as a sociologist, I, I not only study how people interact with one another, but I study how people interact with institutional structures. That is how, how do the places where we work or go to school impact our behaviors and impact our lives. And so I think if employers begin to allow more flex work, work from home, give us more paid sick leave, which is something that there are conversations about this happening, um, perhaps notice that um, work can actually be done at home and doesn't need to be done in the office. I, I think that only if we can restructure, if only employers can restructure jobs and make them more flexible, will that really impact future um, traditional gender roles? And Because if they don't, women will probably revert back to doing the second and third shift work. And again, it might be that more men want to do that, but it won't be possible because employers will kind of revert back to their nine to five at home or at work. Um, not allowing sort of families to to sort of manage in the new in this new way. We've had conversations about pay equity for a really long time, and things have changed, but not entirely, because the primary reason why we see a sex pay gap is because women and men work in different jobs or occupations, and the ones that women work in pay far less than the ones that men do. Um, and now with the economy suffering as it is with the pandemic, employers probably are going to say, we can't be concerned so much with um, issues of pay and equity because we're simply trying to stay afloat. Um, but one thing that might happen, um, we've seen happen before, is that in times of economic stress or some other, other major changes at work or in the economy, sometimes people who argue for change are successful because um, things are so different. And they argue now is the time to make new systems and new rules because we've kind of been upended our lives and, you know, work has suddenly become different. And so when people end up going back to work and kind of slowly backing into the economy, they might be more willing to talk about it or employers might be more willing to hear about what can change, what worked when we are all at home, what didn't work, and it might, we might be able to open up those conversations with our employers. So when we think about COVID and its impact on the labor force, I mean, I think what's clear is that parents, working parents are not being set up for success when they're expected to work from home full time with the kids at home full time. Um, hiring a nanny or going back to school might not be an option for everyone given potential cost. Or, um, you know, if somebody in the family has a pre-existing condition. So I think that's an important reality to acknowledge. And um, overall, this whole situation is just calling for new ways to support families during COVID and beyond. 
Now, to what extent could this impact the labor force or the labor market? I think um, it is a little bit too early to tell. Um, when we think about uh, essential workers, for example, there are two main groups. Uh, one group which has a high barrier of entry, such as nurses, and another group that does not, um, such as you know, grocery uh, grocery store uh, cashiers. Um, and we can think that potentially COVID might um, might facilitate conversations around pay uh, pay equity among those uh, the essential workers in the first group, but not necessarily the second. And I'll add something to that when you're talking about grocery store workers, and, and I don't know if this is happening, but what, what tends to happen in jobs where men enter them, we suddenly see them as being more prestigious or requiring or deserving of more pay. So if, if men are becoming grocery store workers in greater numbers than they were before, it could be that the reward for these workers might change. And that's, you know, this is all happened so quickly and we don't know how long these shifts in, or the demand for grocery store workers are going to happen and what other kind of jobs where men are entering because there are no other jobs where women have primarily worked. But that's, always, that's something to keep an eye on. That is, if jobs traditionally done by women are being filled by men because they have no other economic opportunities, It'll be interesting to see in the future if there is a shift in the way we reward and recognize those jobs. Do you think that might help with this journey towards pay equity? I mean, if if men are, are entering these jobs with a little barriers to entry, I mean, if we're valuing them, I mean, that's terrible to say, but it unfortunately is society we live in. And would we see, you know, at least a higher rate of living across all of those jobs? That's a great question. And I think the answer is, it depends on what happens to women in those jobs. Sort of if, if we, in three months from now, see more women going back because other opportunities for men open, nothing might change. Or employers may realize, I mean, it, as you said, this is sort of a sad, the sad world we live in. But if we see that, it's, it's called the devaluing of women's work, which is the idea that, well, if women are doing it, well, clearly it can't be that important. It can't be that hard. And when men do it, it must be challenging and it must require that we pay them more. And so if we see women even moving back into these jobs, so they're, again, the primary holders of these jobs after men may move into the sort of original jobs that they had before the pandemic, maybe an employer might see like, oh, look, that's, a, that's an essential job. That's one we need to have filled. That's important. But I don't know. Time will tell. I saw an article today, I think, I think it was this morning, that said that one of the many crises that the U.S. is facing is that caretakers are not returning to work because they're making more on unemployment than what they are getting paid in their previous jobs. Do you think that, what kind of impact will that have on the healthcare industry? Well, thank you. That's a very good question. I think that the impact, it's kind of unprecedented, but I mean, in some ways, I think I'm, I'm optimistic in, in, in this sense. Like, I think that if anything, it will just encourage pay rises in the healthcare industry and realize that if a caretaker can make more money elsewhere, be it in unemployment or be it in, you know, perhaps providing care to a family on a kind of a personal or private basis, then the, the healthcare industry needs to step up and provide competitive, competitive pay. And I mean, we've seen that actually in other types of jobs, right? I mean, we've seen that sometimes if you look at care for young kids, we see that oftentimes preschool teachers will decide that they want to become a nanny because they can make more money as a nanny than being a preschool teacher. So unless that sector steps up and starts compensating workers for their worth, they're going to move out of that sector. And, and to add to that, I think this also demonstrates, you know, that, you know, employers have this notion that, well, women will do the work of caregiving as nurses or as healthcare providers because they love to care for people. And they'll, they'll kind of give up a high wage as long as they can do this care work because, you know, women are supposed to do it. And I think what this is showing is that women, much like men, want to get paid. Sure, people care about the kind of things that they do on the job. But um, if they can make more money doing something else, that might be a more lucrative occupation for them than the care work that they do now. Women will walk away from that. 
and do the other kind of work. Right. And I think another assumption is that, for example, in education, it is common that teachers do not have a high salary because back in the day, there was, I mean, there was the assumption that most teachers were women and most teachers were married to a breadwinner. Now, as you know, as obviously the family unit is very diverse, we cannot continue making those assumptions. So we need to really rethink and change some of these structures that maybe had, you know, maybe were working, quote unquote, in the past, but they definitely do not work anymore. With everything that's happening with, with Black Lives Matter and all of those movements, do you both think that we will see more equality for women of color? I would argue yes, because conversations around racism and sort of the unfair and unequal treatment of Black Americans like forever are finally being had. And just with those conversations alone, we're going to see conversations surrounding Black women's roles. And, you know, a lot of the people I hear being interviewed are women, are Black women. And I heard an interview the other day where she says, I am mad. I mean, these things have been happening forever. And finally, you're paying attention to my voice. And so I think that as we open our minds, we as white people open our minds to seeing the tragedies that have happened over the centuries and the way that we benefit from racism, that we will inevitably see the way that we've treated Black women and relied on them, you know, for our domestic work and, and recognize that Black women have largely been working all the time. It's white women who've recently just, you know, recently in the like past 50 years who, who started joining the labor force, but Black women have never been afforded that opportunity to stay at home. They've always been engaged in the labor market, and I think we'll probably begin to see and understand and maybe appreciate that better. I am uh, hopeful and optimistic, and I think that this is an opportunity to um, really reestablish race relations in a different way, recognizing what we've been doing until this point did not work. Um, but I think we should not take this for granted either. I mean, this is an opportunity if we leverage it and if we support these ideas, these novel ideas in a sustained fashion. Um, we cannot just think that by doing small seminars here and there, um, we're, we're, we've done our part. This requires um, political action. This requires us to vote and vote well and make sure that we see not just uh, ideas being discussed, but actually an improvement in our communities and um, in, a, in a sustained way. I'll add to that too. I think this is going to give us an opportunity as scholars and researchers to really unpack how we've studied our topics. For instance, a lot of the work that I do treats all women the same. And my excuse is that, oh, my, the data set that I'm using has so few women of color in it that I can't separate their experience from the, the experiences of white women. And I know that's problematic. We know that's problematic because you're seeing, you know, white women aren't rising up saying that they've been mistreated. It's, it's the women of color who are saying this. So their experiences are not the same. And so I think as scholars, we are going to do sort of a reassessment of the way that we analyze and study the differences among men and women of color and men and women who are white. So I'm hoping that that happens and that we, we begin to say, well, the data, we don't have enough people of color in our sample. We begin to say, we need to collect more data on people who are not white. In community health, there's a long tradition um, to culturally tailor interventions and also a long tradition of conducting community-based participatory research, or CVPR. And the goal of CVPR is to make sure that um, minority populations or communities are not just included in a study as study participants, but to make sure that they're also part of the research team and sometimes help an investigator decide what are the best research questions and hypotheses um, in, in a given study. Now, I think the current crisis might serve as a catalyst to launch this research program beyond the scope of community health, which has primarily focused on questions on health equity and health disparities and the social determinants of health, and transcend those boundaries into 
a research program, but it's more interdisciplinary and that touches subjects such as education and criminal justice. I know that's, I mean, that's one thing that, that we've talked about too. I mean, even in fundraising is that there's no like one size fits all, right? And so mm -hmm. how do we adapt our practices to reach the most, the most mm -hmm. people? But I think, I mean, to your point, Julie, it's something obviously I not thought about, but that women of color have not had the opportunity to not work. And that, I mean, that's, it's a completely different conversation. Yeah, and it's um, happened because we've given black men, so we've been disadvantaging them for so long and discriminating against hiring them in the labor market that black women who are married to black men really have no choice, right? But to, but to take the jobs and, and get jobs and work. You both have talked a lot about women serving in that caretaker role, whether we want to or not, in a lot of ways, it's just kind of ingrained in who we are. Do you think that there will be a push for more females to join police forces to help with this need for less of a militant action? I could say that by doing that, or if it police forces or communities or cities trying to do that, I think they're misunderstanding the problem. That if cities and communities attempt to bring more women into the police force because they have this idea that, you know, they'll be different than men, they'll be less aggressive than men, that's a huge burden to place on the female officers that they feel like, well, now we're responsible for making this change. I agree with Julie in the sense that I'm not sure I see a connection between minority women and the police institution as such. If anything, minority women and minority men have been victims of police brutality for way too long. So the current crisis suggests that we take immediate action in reforming the police and rethinking their training, their understanding of race relations, and their use of violence. At the same time, um, I mean, while we acknowledge that we cannot accept police brutality of any sort, I think it is important to recognize that in some situations, the police are being asked to do too much and they do not have the training to do some of the work that they're asked to do right now. For example, when it comes to handling mental health issues. So I do think that we, we might need to find um, alternative solutions and um, creating maybe a different type of police workforce that can better handle these cases. As we both said, this, the change needs to happen at the structural level. And, and in a lot of conversations um, in cities around the United States is that police, again, as Anna said, are not equipped to handle sort of mental health problems a lot of people they encounter. So maybe one positive thing that will come out of this, the situations both with the demonstrations and with COVID-19, is the recognition of the importance of people who work on who work with mental health issues and social workers do this a lot and it's a lot of the jobs that women hold so perhaps please the police force can look into making people who work in these jobs a central portion of who they who they employ so thinking about all of this what will the impacts on i mean obviously a generalization but on women's mental health because to your point of, you know, only 3% of them are, feel like men are doing the majority of the work, but they're not necessarily self-identifying or recognizing the amount of pressure that's on them right now. I mean, will we, do you think we'll see a movement in that way of more mental health support or will it just be more, we're taking on the burden and... I think if we don't do anything, anything different, women and men, I mean, families in general are struggling and, and, and we're seeing a uh, you know, spike in mental health issues, you know, across, across conditions, right? Not just depression, anxiety, and others. So I do want to go back to this idea that I think COVID-19 is offering really an opportunity for to redesign many policies that we had in place or, or create new policies that need to support families. We think about, you know, perhaps a universal preschool program, providing basic income to caregivers, increasing flexibility at work. I think COVID has really shown us that we can work very differently, that maybe the nine to five schedule doesn't work for everyone. And it's not even rational in many ways. So perhaps we can think about work differently as well and, and, and generate flexibility that will help families, both men and women. And I think all of that um, together could really improve mental health across the board.
Yeah, and thinking along those lines too, um, if you think about all the jobs that I mentioned before that women predominantly hold, they do a lot of mental work in those jobs. They do a lot of mental health support. Think about teachers who engage with children all day. They're not just teaching them, they're providing them sort of love and support. Think about nurses, how they expend a lot of mental energy, sort of assisting the families of people they're caring for and also the people they're caring for. So I think we're, we're stripping away this very important role. We're stripping away sort of the band-aid over what we tend to think of women's like, oh, they just do it because they're good at it. But now we're seeing, well, someone needs to do this. Someone needs to care for sick people. Someone needs to care for children. And women have been doing this a lot. And so maybe the sort of mental stress that a lot of women feel, these pressures, these, this, these things that make them um, suffer from uh, depression and low self-esteem, we're finally being able to sort of see those come to the surface. And it may mean changes, as, as Anna just said, changes in the way that we pay individuals or that we reward or um, recognize individuals who are doing this kind of work. One of the areas that I am interested in hearing from you both on is more on the family interaction because of COVID and how we're changing who's at home and who is doing what. And I think for me, I am always concerned about those children at home (laughs) because that's what my background is in. So how are you seeing or is there research that the gender roles are even being pushed further onto the children in the household? So are, you know, younger girls taking on more of the responsibilities when they're maybe their mother or their father can't balance that? What's I just have a very simple answer to that, which is the, sh- the certain shifts that, or the work that we see women doing, um, like mothers has been the caregiving and the cooking and the cleaning and sort of the mental support of the family. And I will add that I'm sure gendered expectations don't know an age. So when a parent needs someone to watch the baby or watch the young child, maybe they'll ask the female, um, the, the older sister, or the older sibling who's a, who's a girl. So again, I think gender role expectations aren't much different for young girls as they are for, for their moms. Yeah, and I think that especially in the developing world, we're seeing some of the strengths uh, more pronounced than in, in the United States or, or other countries in Europe. So for example, we're seeing that whenever there's an ill uh, family member, usually it is young women that will go and provide care for that person. So we do see some of the strengths definitely in the developing world, less so in, in the United States. If you were to give our listeners a call to action, how would you encourage them to continue this conversation and to help move redefining their gender roles, moving towards equity? What, what, kind, what could we leave them with? I think what's going to be really important as we begin to sort of quote unquote go back to normal is that we think a lot about the way employers structure jobs. That is, if we could all learn something from this and move forward, we need to be really asking the people who we work for to think about what just happened, how people still got work done, and the importance of a lot of the work that that, that women are doing that oftentimes gets overlooked. And I think what, what might happen or what, what you can do is advocate for higher pay for teachers, advocate for higher pay of, for people who do essential work. You can imagine that any household with children in school probably realized within a day or two how hard it is to care for children, to have to educate children. So if, if you can go forth and do something, I would say, One, ask employers to really think about the way they structure jobs. They need more flex time. We need to have more time when people can have different shifts. And we also need to advocate for the pay of people who do a lot of the invisible work, the invisible care work. So go fight for those people. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I think we need to recognize what what were the unnecessary structures that have been, that were in place before that are that are really not helpful to anyone. Like for example, what I was mentioning before, the nine to five schedule. Do we need everybody working nine to five? Can we have different shifts so that at least in Seattle, we don't have these huge traffic jams every time we try to move around those, those hours, those peak hours. 
perhaps some people work nine to five, others can work 12 to eight. I don't know. There could be different schedules to accomplish work. And I do agree that there might be some, so it might be important to have some core hours where everyone is in the office, but everyone else, in fact, it, it, it's, it's better if they're coming in and out at different times. So kind of recognize what, what was not really working before and what, what, could, what could be different when it comes to work. And then when it comes to a home, kind of recognize also what it takes to run a household with or without kids. And it takes a huge amount of work that usually falls on women, usually is invisible, usually is unpaid. And um, that's not a recipe for success. So that's not what we want for our daughters and, and for, our, for the future generations of women. So I think that recognizing that and whatever your family, I mean, you know, and of course there are many types of families. There are families with two mothers, two fathers, two, you know, there, there are many types of, of families. So just, but just recognizing all the work that needs to be done so that it can be shared and done collaboratively. And then I would say recognize that we need creative policymakers moving forward. So please vote every time you have a chance and vote well. <laughs> so vote for creative policymakers that will come up with ideas to, to move us forward. We're not going back to our pre-COVID world. We're moving forward and, and we need new policies and new solutions.